Hello, everybody. This is Dale from the Precept Classes in Coleman, Alabama, and I thank you for joining with us. Uh, we're continuing a study called The Divided Heart and the Divided Nation, and we're looking at the nation of Israel and what is happening uh, with the kings and things like that. Uh, this is Lesson 2, and we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 3 and chapter 4, and we're seeing where Solomon, and forgive me if I say David, from time to time I'll say David, but it's Solomon, uh, is solidifying his kingdom and the things that are happening there. At the very first of uh, the third chapter, we see that Solomon strikes a marriage alliance with Pharaoh of Egypt. Solomon marries his daughter. Now, a lot of people want to say that he did this because it, uh, the nation of it, uh, Egypt, how powerful it was and everything. I think it was the other way around. I think Egypt saw what had occurred in the previous 500 years since the slaves had left, and this nation was of Israel was becoming very, very powerful. So therefore, uh, the Pharaoh wanted something here that would be protective in nature. We'll see more about this in a later lesson, but just know this for now. that this was the foundation for some problems yet to come, some patterns of behavior in Solomon's life. Uh, immediately, the Lord tells us that Solomon loved the Lord. He loved the Lord and that he walked in the statutes of his father David, except that Solomon sacrificed uh, and burnt incense on the high places. You're going to see that phrase throughout the Old Testament, accept uh, sacrifice and burn incense on the high places. We spend a lot of time in our local classes examining what this may mean. We're going to learn more as we go along. But basically, the high places are generally speaking of places where the pagans and the heathen of the land would offer sacrifice and would worship their gods. We actually went back to Deuteronomy 12, and I would suggest that you go back and read that chapter where God warned his people about this that you were not to do anything like that, that when you found these places on the high places and under every green tree where the heathen worship the land and worship all the creation, that you're to go and to utterly destroy these items of worship, the Asherah and the places that were worshipped, that you are not to do this. What we're seeing here is how even Solomon was getting caught up in what the nation of Israel would do eventually which was a synchronistic type of thing, a synthesization of the patterns of practice of the world in with what God was saying to do. You also see, though, a very vivid picture of God's grace and God's mercy here. Because Solomon's heart was after God. He loved God, except he was being sidetracked here in this burnt offering and the things in the high places. We'll see more about this as we go along. So we see that Solomon and the people of Israel went into Gibeon, and they offered a thousand sacrifices in one night. Now, this is where the Mosaic Tabernacle was at, the Tent of Meeting and the Altar. The Ark of the Covenant was in Jerusalem, and we've uh, talked about that before in previous classes, but you see it very well defined right here. Solomon goes here simply, I believe, to worship the Lord. He goes to worship Him and offer the sacrifices of praise. Now, Gibeon was called the great high place. It was a high place. And this was a place where God had told him, apparently, to put the uh, Mosaic tabernacle. So that's the reason you can't quite say all the time that high places are always evil. But here's the high place where Solomon went to offer sacrifice in the Mosaic altar in that area. I do believe around there there were high places also. Okay, So immediately thereafter, God appears to Solomon in a dream. And God says this to Solomon, Ask, what shall I give thee? That is one of the greatest questions that you can ever imagine. Can you imagine what would occur if God said that to you? Just ask what you want and I will give it to you. And, and Solomon reflected upon this. I think this actually goes back to why Solomon was uh, offering the sacrifices. Because he'd had a little experience at this time as king, he was beginning to realize, well, I mean, I need wisdom in this thing. He offers sacrifices to God. God comes and says, what do you want? And Solomon says, you know, I really need to have an understanding heart to judge this great people that you've placed me over. I need your discernment. And this was so pleasing to God that God says, I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you a wise and understanding heart. This is something that if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you can ask, and he will grant beyond measure. It so pleased the Lord that the Lord sat there and said, you know, since you didn't ask for riches and long life or victory over your enemy or honor or anything like that, I'm going to grant that unto you. Well, Solomon awoke, and he immediately went down to Jerusalem to the Ark of the Covenant, and he worshiped there. I believe we're seeing uh, something that foreshadows what was written 1,100 years later in Hebrew, that he realized, wait a minute, this sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats is not enough. And he went down and he worshiped and offered a sacrifice and a peace offering before the Ark of the Covenant. And then he prepared a meal for his servant. Well, immediately thereafter, we have an account, uh, which even all the world knows, 
uh, if, even if they're unsaved, never heard of the Bible, there's an account of this type of story where you had two harlots that bring a case before King Solomon. You know the story. You saw what happened there in your studies. Solomon heard. He asked for a sword, and he was going to divide the child in half. Well, the true mother arose and said, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. These women had been fighting and arguing in front of the king. And the other woman said, no, let it be cut in half. If none of us can have the whole thing. Well, it obviously revealed who the true mother was. The chapter closes with people being amazed by Solomon's wisdom and the understanding that the Lord had given him. Now, 1 Kings chapter 4, just very quickly, it's sort of a structural kind of thing here, what's going on in the nation of Israel. You see Solomon's wisdom in setting up officials, and several of them are listed. Then he had deputies, and he had 12 deputies, and these 12 deputies and their people had responsibility for providing provision for King Solomon, so they did it every month. And then you see the entire scope of the kingdom and you see the wisdom that Solomon had. And the last chapters of, uh, last verses of chapter 4 right there describe in detail the discerning heart and the wisdom and how uh, the world was amazed. It also describes how uh, Solomon wrote a lot of stuff. He wrote many proverbs. He wrote a thousand and five songs. I find that interesting. Not a thousand and four, not a thousand and six. A thousand and five songs. We have many more songs of David, and we often think of David as being the psalmist who wrote all the songs. But Solomon wrote many, many, many. And then it describes some of the things. He wrote about trees. He wrote about hyssop on the wall. He had wisdom of how the things of God's creation work. And he wrote songs about it, and he wrote proverbs about it. And he had such a wisdom that all the world and all the uh, leaders of the world would come and see him. A little spiritual hyperbole right there. God will use hyperbole from time to time to drive home the fact of his wisdom and who all came to see him. At this point, the people of Israel were as numerous as the sands of the sea. There was peace. There was safety. There was provision. They were eating and they were drinking and they were rejoicing. This is literally uh, 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 the fulfillment of what God had revealed to uh, Abraham in Genesis 15, that your people will be as numerous as a seed. Also, it's a fulfillment of what was foreshadowed and what the Lord told to the people through Samuel of how the king would take this and take this and take this and all this kind of stuff. And it's at this point in time where you see Israel literally living in peace, eating, drinking, and rejoicing before the Lord. Again, I'm Dale from the Precept Classes in Coleman, Alabama, and I thank you for being with us. Uh, check the website, uh, the Facebook group page right there, and you'll see what we're reading for the next week, and I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.